Hey guys, sorry for not being able to be there today. My nieces are getting baptized in St. Paul, Minnesota, and so I'm up there, but uh, we're going to continue with class anyway. Hooray! As a result of that, however, we're going to go ahead and skip the rest of 3A just for today. Um, whenever we have class again, I'll finish going over it with you. Uh, Gnosticism, unfortunately, is one of the most convoluted things in the world if you are not fam like intimately familiar with it and understanding how they think. And so I think that trying to go over Irenaeus is against heresies any further or at all um, would be uh, a mistake if I'm not there to take questions if you have them, because you very well may. Um, plus, the readings are a little bit more complicated, and so um, it'd be a good idea if I was there to, uh, to help you out with that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and move on to 3B and hopefully get through 3E today. Um, for those of you who are panicking, they're not long sections, right? So uh, remember, we've been going over heresies up to this point, and so everything that follows is a type of heresy. It's a way of uh, understanding Christian theology that is mistaken. Um, maybe Christian, especially for the first couple, really ought to be in quotation marks there because let's be honest, um, they're not quite Christians, or at least they don't, they're, they're something very strange if they are Christians. For those of you who are super anal about keeping your notes in order, uh, the readings from 3A take up about a page and a half in most people's notes based on what I've been getting from the study guides back. And so uh, leave yourself that space and we can go ahead and start with 3B. 3B is Marcionism. Um, which is actually just a form of Gnosticism. You should be able to see that on the screen right now. The definition says it's the well, most well-known of all the Gnostic sects, um, and that what distinguishes it from the others is that it claims that the one God is a God of love, and that the Demiurge is a God of law. And Marcion gets this out of St. Paul, because St. Paul is always making this dichotomy between law and grace, and the grace comes from God because he loves us, and so... You've got law and grace um, happening there. And so that makes Marcion a little bit different because he is actually trying to pull things out of the text in a much more significant le uh, manner. Most Gnostics are throwing things into the text. They're, they're doing what we would call eisegesis or um, putting their ideas into the text. Uh, Marcion is actually trying to get his ideas from St. Paul. Uh, the reason, however, that we're covering Marcionism uh, differently uh, or over and above all the other Gnostic sects is because Marcion uh, did something particular. And so uh, Marcion is the person who's important here, his actions per se, rather than the heresy itself. And of course, I should, I should back up and say that Marcion's maintains this distinction that the Gnostics make between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. And he assumes that they are different, right? So the, the one who is the God of the New Testament, he's the God of love. And the Demiurge, who's the God of the Old Testament, he's the God of law. And so that's why there's so many laws in the Old Testament. And then Jesus comes to set us free from those laws because he loves us and freedom and love go together in St. Paul. Um, and so... And in St. Paul, that's because in order to truly love, you have to make a free choice to care about somebody you can't just be made to, right? So uh, there's that. So looking at Marcion's life, uh, what makes him important there, and you should be able to see this on the screen, is letter E, right? He's the first person to create a canon of scripture. And that's, that's what makes him distinct and important. His canon of scripture only had 10 epistles, so 10 of St. Paul's letters. And then like a redacted form of Luke. I think it took out like three or four chapters, um, not all in a row, but like piecemeal throughout the thing um, of information that he felt was uh, contrary to this idea about the Old Testament God being a God of law and the New Testament God being a God of love. Um, but that really gets people going. At least it's, it's our first record of it. And I think that it, I think that it's fair to say that it legitimately motivated early Christians. Right. So it's our first record of um, someone really trying to get the trying to get the books of the New Testament in a list so that we knew which books to read and which books not to read, which books were actually the Word of God 
and which ones were uh, heretical or just normal text that some orthodox person wrote, you know, somebody with right teaching wrote, but they weren't actually scripture. However, uh, some other facts about Marcion's life, since he's a figure that we're going to be talking about, he was originally the son of a bishop, um, which might seem strange, but in the time frame, uh, clerical celibacy, so the requirement that priests and bishops uh, be celibate and not get married, was not the norm. It happened, and it was even lauded, but it wasn't, it wasn't normal, right? And so his dad was married, and he was a bishop, and he had children, and Marcion was one of those children, and I guess his relationship was with his father was a little rocky um, because his dad excommunicates him for some sort of sin, something wrong he did. Maybe it was being a Gnostic. Maybe it was sleeping with his girlfriend. You know, uh, maybe he denied the faith before the Romans. I don't know, right? But he gets excommunicated for doing something immoral. And his answer to this is to skip town, right? So he moves to Rome and starts a Gnostic school there in 140 AD. Um, what we didn't get to finish in, in, in 3A is that the Gnostics, generally speaking, work out of schools that they've started that are not directly related to the hierarchy. That's how they're able to get their teachings into the Christian community without the permission of the, of the bishops and the, and the priests. Um, so, so he starts one of those and it's in, in 140 in Rome. And in about, after about four years of him being there, the Pope makes, it has a clear idea of what it is he's teaching in this school, and he excommunicates him for the Gnosticism in 144 AD. Um, so that's Marcion's life. Uh, again, he's a Gnostic leader. Marcionism is a form of Gnosticism. And, but what makes him important and distinct is that he's got these ten epistles and the gospel, an edited version of Luke, which is the first list of, of someone trying to figure out what books should be in the New Testament. Um, he's the first guy that we have on record, at least, who actually did that. Um, and given that he was a Gnostic, um, the Orthodox individuals, the, the Catholics, didn't want to be undone, right? So they were like, well, maybe we'd better answer this question. And uh, it gets the ball rolling on that. So that's the reason Marcion's important. And that's the end of 3B. Um, as I said, these sections are really short. Um, we're covering one heresy at a time, right? So 3B is done. That puts us on to 3C. And the heresy we're covering in 3C is Manichaeism, right? Um, I might slip up. I have a tendency of calling it Manichaeanism, and that's because the, man, the people who follow Manichaeism are usually called Manichaeans. Um, so forgive me, but the normal phrase for it is Manichaeism. Um, Manichaeism is a syncretistic missionary Zoroastrian offshoot that incorporated the mythology of local religions for the sake of converting adherents to the underlying ideology. Now, what does that mean? Well, the syncretistic thing basically just means they're doing the same thing the Gnostics did. In the, and, and so your book actually refers to them as Gnostics, although I don't think that that's accurate because the Gnostics um, in this time frame are essentially Neoplatonists, right? And, and the Manichees are Zoroastrians, right? So, so that's the essential distinction between them, right? That, that it's, a, it's syncretistic, yes, but it's not Neoplatonic and Zoroastrian. Now, is there any Neoplatonism in it? Probably, but, but ultimately it's a Zoroastrian religion um, or a form of Zoroastrianism, which we'll get, we'll get to in a second. Right, but what makes it syncretistic, in case it's not clear, is that it is the incorporating the mythology of local religions. Right, Syncretist, syncretism is a way of taking a bunch of different schools of thought or of religion and uh, molding them together, uh, weaving them together into something. And so, the way that Manichaeism is syncretistic primarily is that it takes local mythologies and it weaves them into its own system. And, of course, the reason that it does this is because it, it doesn't really care about the particulars of the faith, you might say, the individual aspects like, you know, Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension or something like that. Um, instead, what it cares about is the moral ideas underneath it. And so any story it can use to teach those moral ideas is the story that it's going to use. And... Um, they justify this, right? And I'm, it's not so much criticism of them. It's just the truth that they justify this by basically a, a being of the assumption that um, their, their good God has 
reached into all of these various religions in an attempt to teach the reality of, of the world, which as far as they're concerned is their underlying moral ideology, right? And so uh, all of these myths probably do teach the reality to some degree or another, depending on how well preserved they've been, um, if, if, if Manichaeans are right. And so given that fact, uh, they why not use the myths, right? And so that's, that's, that's the idea, though. So the syncretism is the fact that they use these myths for the underlying ideology, the moral precepts that they're going to teach, which we'll get to in a second. So all that there's really left to talk about is the fact that it's missionary, which means that it wants to spread itself. Its goal is to get more adherence. Right? Its goal is to get more people following Manichaeism. Right? And then the fact that it's Zoroastrian. Now, what is Zoroastrianism? Zoroastrianism is a religion that follows a prophet whose name in uh, English is usually referred to as Zoroaster. However, um, in his native language, it's something more like Zarathustra. So occasionally you'll see it written Zarathustra. If you ever read um, Nietzsche, he writes his book called Thus Spoke Zarathustra, where he's just appropriating the name for himself. But so, so these people follow this guy named Zoroaster, and he lived before Moses in ancient Persia. And basically at the time in ancient Persia, there were these two groups of people, right? You have these, these uh, sedentary farmers who actually made things and grew food and took care of themselves, right? And then you had these, uh, you know, sort of jerks on horses, these knights, right? And what they would do is they'd run around and they'd steal stuff from the farmers. So the farmers were taking care of themselves and the knights and being slaughtered. And uh, Zoroaster stands up and basically says, this is not right. You must stop. So basically, right, he creates this uh, mythology or this, this religion in which all of the gods of the horse riding people are evil and all of the gods of the farming people are good. And so everyone should follow the farming gods, which are all sort of molded into this one god who uh, he calls Ahura Mazda, which is the highest of the gods. And then, of course, the, the gods of the nomadic horsemen who are stealing all this stuff, they all get... Uh, combined into this single evil force, which is Angra Menu, which makes Zoroastrianism unique insofar as it's not a monotheistic religion like we're used to, where there's one god, and then Satan is like this angel who's a pitiful nothing compared to him, right? And so the forces of good are powerful, and the forces of evil are relatively weak compared to the forces of good, right? In, um, in Zoroastrianism, there are two gods. There's, they're always at war, one of which is the good god and one of which is the evil god. And um, you obviously want to be on the side of the good god because then you're good. right? So, so that's Zoroastrianism in a nutshell. And again, as you can see on the screen, that idea is called dualism, right? which is different than monotheism. So then let's talk about some basic um, aspects of Manichaeism then. Um, it was founded in Persia uh, by a man, and I might not be able to say this right, whose name is Shuraik, Shuraik, um, but he takes the title Manny, so everyone calls him Manny, okay? And Manny is kind of like a title like, like Buddha or Christ. Um, literally, it, I think it means basically the same thing as Buddha, which is illuminated one, right? The man who's filled with light, right? And so that's Manny. So his followers are Manichaeans or Manichaeans, depending on uh, which book you're reading. Um, so that's the guy who founded it, right? And that's where it gets its name from, right? They, they are the followers of the illuminated one, who's Manny. And basically, Manny taught this dualism, right? That there's these, this perfectly good god who is the god of light, and there's this perfectly evil god who's the god of darkness, okay? And so that's the dualist aspect of the religion, and it's one of the more important um, underlying ideologies. And what the Manichaeans did is that they would break uh, all of their followers up into the elect and the hearers, right? So there were two groups of people. And you could essentially think of the elect as the clergy and hearers as the regular followers of the religion. Um, it'd be more accurate to refer to the elect as strict followers of the religion, though, and the hearers as, like, weaker followers or lesser followers, um, the elect were all wandering monks, so uh, they they moved from place to place, and they were celibates. 
essentially, right? They're all wandering monks. Whereas the adherers lived more or less normal lives within the context of this religion, um, obviously. And so they were required to keep their Ten Commandments, which weren't, aren't exactly the same as our Ten Commandments, but they had ten and they had to keep them. And then on top of that, they had to worship and support the elect, which might sound like it's some sort of uh, personality cult sort of thing where the elect are trying to manipulate these people to take care of them, um, which might be fair. But I want to say that the elect actually are true believers in this religion for the most part, because we're going to see here in a second what the requirements were for being a member of the elect. And uh, they aren't easy, right? It's not something you would, if you're trying to create a religion, like a health and wealth gospel sort of thing, where you're like, like, oh, give me your money and I'll make you happier, right? Um, this would not be the way to do it, okay? Uh, it's, it's a little bit too stringent for that. So I think it'd be more accurate to say that the reason that you have the elect and the hearers is because if every person on earth followed Manichaeism the way that the elect did, everyone would be dead in a couple of weeks, right? And so the, the system just cannot function if everybody really, really, really follows it. Um, and so what develops is people who really, really, really follow it, who will die if the, the, the lesser followers don't make sure that they don't die, right? And so that's where this... Uh, support thing comes from and then you worship them because like they're really doing it right and I'm you know if you're a hero I'm just a weak guy who can't really do all of this but I, I respect them for actually achieving the religion um, now just like Zoroastrianism Manichaean Manichaeism has this threefold morality right what Zoroaster taught was that we should you should say no evil do no evil and think no evil um, so if you do those three things, then you'll be a decent person, more or less, right? Um, and that's the essential more underlying theology from the moral standpoint of Manichaeism, right? Uh, speak no evil, do no evil, and think no evil, except that they add something to the speaking principle, which is eat no evil. Because they have foods that are supposed to be good for your soul and foods that are supposed to be bad for your soul. And so they've thrown that into the speaking no evil thing because you do both with your mouth. Right? So you might be able to think about Manichaeism in a sort of like a do no evil with your mouth, do no evil with your mind, and do no evil with your hands. Right, um, In the speaking, doing, and thinking of, of, of Zoroastrianism. Right, And so then speaking and eating can kind of get mixed together, and they take that out of the Zoroastrian moral principles, which is speaking, th doing, and thinking. On top of that, they, they all prayed four times a day. Um, facing either the sun, the moon, or north, depending on what time of day it is and whether or not you were in a situation where you could see the sun or the moon. Um, and the reason that they would do that is because Zoroastrian, Zoroastrians um, worship fire. And um, because they take this, the god of good is a god of light thing, very literally. Um, and so they worship fire. And, you know, those are giant lights in the sky, and right? So they're like heavenly lights, right? And so if you're going to worship the light, then you should worship the heavenly lights. Um, so that's what they do. Finally, and this is what really gets um, Augustine, St. Augustine, interested in them, because St. Augustine was a Manichae for a very long time, uh, is that, and I think this is actually what attracts most people to their religion, is that... They're trying to create a perfectly consistent intellectual system so that you don't need to have faith to believe it, right? Um, that the system is so non-contradictory that it just explains everything perfectly. And you just hold it all in your mind. And if you just do that, um, then there's no reason to have faith in any of it, right? You just know it uh, without a doubt. Um, and so that makes it clearly distinct from Christianity, and that's the important distinction that Augustine finds in his life, is that that idea of being able to think yourself into salvation, if you just know the right thing, then you'll always do it, right? It becomes uh, something that he finds ultimately to be not true of himself. So, but, but that's why most people find it uh, compelling. The last thing we want to do with Manichae uh, Manichaeism is to look at the requirements of the elect, what the elect had to do to show you that like it was pretty strict. So that should be up on the screen now. And what it says is that they were forbidden from owning property. So, you know, complete poverty, 
they couldn't eat meat or drink wine. They couldn't settle in one spot, so they could they, they could not have a home. They had to be homeless. It doesn't mean they had to sleep outdoors, but they had to be homeless. They couldn't get a job, which strictly speaking means they could make money in no way, shape, or form. They could if they could mind you, they didn't own anything, but if they did own something or they had it in their possession, they couldn't sell it. They were not allowed to be uh, economically productive in any way, shape, or form. They weren't allowed to practice magic, which, fine, I guess that forbids trying to tell the future and, and practicing other religions. And finally, they were not allowed to satisfy their sexual desires in any way, shape, or form at all. Right? And that, you know, A through F there, that's a really difficult thing to do. Right? And so if you were just trying to manipulate people, into taking care of you, you could see why require like that's not you. You take it a little easier on yourself, um, and you could also see there why I would say that if everyone were elect, right, we would all die because we would all, none of us would be economically productive, which means that um, we wouldn't have food, right? And so you want to have food, otherwise you die. Um, we also wouldn't have shelters in most most likely. Um, because if, if no one's staying in one spot, then probably no one's building buildings, right? And so um, the system of, a system of only the elect just wouldn't work, which is why they developed this system of the heroes. The only thing that might be strange on this list that you wouldn't like just understand, like, oh, yeah, I can see sort of why they do that is the no eating meat part. The no drinking wine, okay, yeah, because it gets you drunk and blah, 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 right? You make poor decisions while you're drunk and okay. The no eating meat, why not eating meat? And the reason for this is that the Manichees share this idea with the, with the Gnostics that matter is basically evil. Um, so meat um, is very obviously nutrient-dense. Right? That's why we like it so much, because it's full of nutrients, which means that it's full of matter. Um, and if matter is evil, then eating it is not good. You see, and... On top of that, plants get their energy from the sun, right? And, and ancient individuals, classical, really, it's sort of after the ancient time frame, uh, they weren't stupid. They, would, they knew this, right? It, it doesn't take that long for you to figure that out. If you uh, have a flower in a pot and you stick it in a room without a window, it's dead after a couple of days, right? So, like, clearly plants need the sun. Um, and so, given that fact, they figured, now this is where they might go wrong scientifically or whatever, but they figured that the plants must be full of light, because without the light they die, so they must be full of light. And so since they take this idea that the good God is a God of light very literally, right, they want to get that light into their body. Um, and this is where the no eating no evil aspect of their religion um, comes into play. So that's Manichaeism. All right. Moving on to 3D. Uh, and we've got, moving on, we've got two left. One's 3D and one's 3E. These ones are really short, really straightforward. Um, the next one is something called Montanism. I'm sorry for three M's in a row, guys. Uh, I don't make the names of these heresies. Uh, the next one is Montanism. And Montanism is when we find our first like properly Christian heresy over and above the Judaizers who we talked about last unit, right? Because the Gnostics and the Marcians were a type of Gnostic, and the Manichees, right, they're not – they're the sort of people that I would want to put quotations around when I call them Christians, right? They're talking – they're using Christian words, um, and in that sense, they I'm not really sure to what extent they fall into the Christian ideology, properly speaking, but they are using Christian words. But the Montanists are like real Christians insofar as they believe in the incarnation and the resurrection and the ascension and the second coming, right? They believe that we're saved by the death of Christ and blah, 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 right? They actually believe in like normal, real Christianity for the most part. Um, what makes them different is that they really don't believe that public revelation has ended. Um, they believe that God is still going to um, send up new prophets to give new information for all of humanity. And they believe that their leaders are some of those prophets. So I have there that it's a, we'll talk about those leaders in a second, but I have there under letter B 
that it's a pseudo-charismatic sect. For those of you who don't know what a charismatic individual is, now usually that means that they can speak well and get people motivated, fine. But in Christianity, it has a specific theological meaning, uh, which means that the Holy Spirit is in that person, and that usually it results in them having like special abilities that normal people don't have, typically to speak in tongues or to heal people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I have pseudo there uh, because clearly the Montanists are wrong, right? Now maybe the Holy Spirit was in them and they were just misinterpreting what was going on, but um, we'll just work on the assumption that this whole thing is, is fabricated, not necessarily um, made up in the sense that they knew that they were tricking people, right? Fabricated in the sense that they were just wrong and and that the, it wasn't the Holy Spirit, and uh, that's too bad for them. So so what makes the Montanists the Montanists? Well. In part, they follow a guy whose name is Monta Montanus, right? So he's the Montanists are the people who follow Montanus. Um, and Montanus uh, has two other prophetesses, female prophets, uh, named Prisca and Maximilla. Prisca means old lady, right? And Maximilla means uh, the little awesome chick. Uh, just as a side note, that's not going to be on the test, but if it, if it helps you remember who they are, it's, it's the old lady and the little awesome chick who follow the mountain guy. Um, that's that's their prophets. Uh, that's just what just what their their names mean. There's no significance there. Um, it's what their mom called them. Uh, but everybody's names have meanings, and that's what their meanings have. And I just whenever I see Prisca, I just think it's funny because because it means old lady. And why on earth any woman would ever name their newborn baby old lady is you know beyond me. <laughs> anyway, so I just I just think it's funny. Uh, I knew a girl in uh, in college whose name was Priscilla, and she was little old lady. Uh, which again, I just I just I think that's hilarious. So, whatever. Um, I actually, we're going to have a lot of fun with the Montanists because the other thing that's true about them is what, what makes them super distinct is, is twofold. But the first is that they're, uh, they're an apocalyptic sect, which means that they believe the end of the world is imminent and coming very soon. And what they believe is that the heavenly Jerusalem, which I guess is like a literal physical place, is going to descend onto the earth. Um, and very shortly, right, and the world is going to end that point. Um, and the place it's going to descend is a place in Phrygia, which is in Asia Minor, what we call today Turkey, but which up until, well, I think probably after World War I, everyone else just called Asia Minor. Because there there were there was a Turkish country before World War I, but they controlled way more than what we call Turkey today. So uh, they believe that it's going to descend on a place in Phrygia called Pepuza. And Pepuza is just one of the most awesome words that have ever been spoken because it just sounds really great to say. Pepuza, right? So you can guarantee that that's going to be on the test, right? Pepuza. Make sure you know that because I like to say it, so I'm going to ask you about Pepuza, all right? So the Montanists believe that uh, the world is going to end soon and that Jerus the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of God, is going to descend upon Papuza in Phrygia, which is where they're from, right? So they're convinced they've got this revelation and that it's coming to their hometown in Papuza. Um, the other thing that they believed is that if you abandon the faith, you know, under persecution, because there was a lot of that at the time, um, that that was it. You couldn't be saved. Right? You're out. Game over. You're going to hell. Very sad for you. Right? Which we talked about last time. But the more rigorous uh, ideology in early Christianity, that once you abandon the faith, that was it. Um, and this is the reason why Tertullian, if everybody remembers Tertullian from last uh, quarter, he became a Montanist. And the reason he became a Montanist is because he was attracted by this rigorous aspect, this aspect that like you really have to, you have to maintain your faith in the face of persecution or that's it, right? Um, because he was hardcore, Tertullian was always halted hardcore, so he was looking for something hardcore. Now he eventually, I think, comes to believe this idea about Papuza is kind of a... Uh, ridiculous thing and he leaves the religion but he ends up creating his own sect because uh, he can't give up this rigorous aspect right and the church in that time frame is is being a little bit more merciful north africa was always pretty hardcore but um, a little bit more merciful okay so that's montanism uh the pseudo charismatic sect created by these three um prophets slash prophetesses um, which believed the world was going to end in a place and that heaven was going to come to a place called Papuza, 
and that uh, if you abandon the faith, you couldn't come back. Um, so that's that's 3D. And uh, that only leaves us with one thing left to cover today, which is super short, and that's called docetism, and that's 3E, docetism. And you, you should be able to see on the screen here that docetism comes from a word called dokesis in Greek, which means appearance or semblance. So if uh, it means semblance means is like the act of seeming to be something, right? And so they believed that Jesus' humanity just seemed real. It wasn't really real. He just appeared as a human, but he wasn't actually a human. You know, basically the idea there is that... That humanity is, you know, pathetic. God is awesome. Right? And so, therefore, uh, God would never become a human. And plus, the whole hypostatic union thing is really a mind-blowing... It doesn't really make any sense. If I'm perfectly honest. Being two things at one time without being a mix of them. What? Right. And so uh, so they just throw out that the idea of the incarnation as a proper real thing, um, because it doesn't make any it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right. Um, and so they just say that he, he looked like a human so that he could he come here and save us. Right. And talk to us, etc. But he wasn't actually a human. And on the face of it, you might see why that's an, that's an appealing ideology, because it gets rid of this whole God man thing, which is confusing. Uh, the biggest problem with it is that if Jesus' humanity was an illusion, then his crucifixion was also an illusion. And it's the crucifixion that saves us. So if his humanity is an illusion, then our salvation is also an illusion. Um, and you don't want your salvation to be an illusion if you're going to be a Christian. Otherwise, what's the point? So um, docetism, in the end of the day, is not worth following. Now, you can sort of forgive the people because like no one had thought through the incarnation before. Right? It's pretty easy um, in the light of you know an, an extra 1,800 or so years of Christian theology to say, like, obviously, docetism is false. But, but, but these are the first guys to think it through, right? And so um, you got to kind of, I imagine, I hope, hopefully at least, that God was relatively merciful on them, so we should be too, right? Um, we, should, we should certainly be because like, we have the advantage of living after them and, and having them already thought through these things. So that's it for today's class. Um, thanks for listening. And uh, I'll see you all tomorrow or the next day, depending on if your class drops tomorrow. Have a wonderful day.